The journey dates back all the way to 12 year old. So that's when I sort of first got involved in coaching. Um, and it was through my dad actually. So my dad ran just a little grassroots club um, in the town near where I lived at the time. And he would always sort of get us involved in that. And at the very early stages, it was just little things like picking up cones and basically being an assistant. Um, but it, it really started to get our brain thinking about coaching. Um, and at the time, we was we were still playing a lot. Uh, but we was always, when I say we, I say we because I'm an identical twin. And as we go okay. through the journey, um, my identical twin brother, Adam, he's, he's pretty much side by side in everything we do. So... It's just a habit now of just saying we. So when I say we, it's because <laughs> there's two of us, really. Um, so we, we were playing football an awful lot um, and we was always late developers. So at, at the age of start, like 12 and 13, that was the time where pre previously, sort of eight, nine-year-old, we would always get picked up by academies and scouted for. Um, and at that time, we actually turned those down. The, the grassroots club we were playing at was full of our teammates, people we went to school with, so we were just having so much fun there. So we never took up the academies, but we did always say, if the opportunity comes at around 12, 13, then we'll pursue it. Um, in the end, those opportunities didn't happen, because at those age, I'm sure you're aware, at 12, 13, you'll have boys playing against men, and we was just the boys at the time. So yeah. that's where we, start, we started sort of entertaining coaching a little bit. Um, and we were coaching alongside some great coaches at the time, my dad being one of them, but he also had a team of coaches as well. Um, and then we, we, we sort of looked up to those guys a lot. There was a couple of coaches in, in my dad's team that was had, or had experience in doing sort of the Camp America stuff. And mm -hmm. that, always, that always got our brain ticking a little bit and was like, that'd be pretty cool. So sort of 12 to 16, we classed those as sort of our development years. So that was a time where we would, we would be on the pitch sort of five days a week and just helping coaches. Uh, we'd sort of be in charge of delivering the last 15 minutes of a, of a session. And my dad had this thing where he would sort of say, you either sink or swim. And he would have this thing in his sessions where at any time he would say, right, Jack, or right, Adam, they're going to deliver the next 15 minutes. And we would mm -hmm. sort of, we would have no plan because we weren't expecting it. Um, and we just had to deliver we had to we had like a team of 10 eight year olds and we were 14 15 at the time and we just had to deliver deliver part of a session um and that was that was really good for our development and it started throughout the years we just got more interested in coaching and it's that started to overtake the playing side of things mm -hmm. and then we at 16 we was able to start actually getting our qualifications in coaching and by this time we were sort of responsible for actually delivering sessions on, on, on our own at 16 to pretty much five days a week. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we got on our FA level one. We, mm -hmm. we did our courses through through the FA. Um, and then sort of went to sixth form and did, a, did a, a sports coaching course. And at this point, this was when we were really thinking about sort of our career in coaching. Yeah. It was 100% it was coaching. We knew that was what, what is, that's what we wanted to do. We just didn't really understand how it would look. You know, we had mm. the ideas of going to America. We had the ideas of group coaching. We just never knew what it was going to look like. Yeah. And then in sixth form, um, that was when we started taking on some goalkeeper sessions as well with just a coach that we knew he was, he sort of needed the help in hand. He needed an extra pair of hands at these sessions. So we mm. just had him out. And at the time he was running one-to-one -one sessions as well, just for his goalkeepers. And, He's really good. So he was really he, he was fully booked pretty much all the time with the waiting list. And he just said, he said, look, boys, do you want to take on a, a few extra sessions doing one to ones? Um, and we were never shy of a challenge. So we were like, yeah, go on. Then we'll, we'll we'll take on we'll take on some goalkeeper sessions. And this was this was would have been sort of like the summer of two thousand and eighteen. Um, and we just we 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 started doing goalkeeper sessions, and that's when we sort of got a passion for the private sessions and the individuals. Um, and it really has just grew from there. I mean, at the very early stages, it was just myself and Adam, my brother, who would just take sessions on a Sunday and they were just goalkeepers. And mm -hmm. then we, that, that's where we thought, maybe, we, maybe this could be our career. We always mm -hmm. were minded and we always 
liked the idea of working for ourselves. Um, mm. And that was at that point that we thought, well, maybe that'll be, this can be our career in coaching. And yeah. we set up AJ One to One Coaching, which was just like a self-employed partnership with myself and my brother. Mm. Uh, and it really did just snowball from there. We started taking on outfield clients and then sort of structuring things. And before we knew it, we was a limited company. We'd rebranded and we, we were sort of where we are today, which I'm sure we'll get into a bit more. Absolutely. All right. Awesome. So tell us a bit about your your, your business then. What, what do you guys specialise in? So we, we specialise in, in the private sessions. So um, a player will just come in and work with one of our coaches and a coach will take them through sort of a specialised programme on, on improving their, their areas of improvements, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, we, we also offer some more programmes. So we've just recently launched uh, female development sessions which is sort of small group training specific for uh, female players. Here in the UK, there's a massive gap between sort of grassroots and the next step of being regional talent centres. So we're trying to bridge that gap and, you know, the ability difference is, is, is outstanding as well. So we're trying to sort of slot into that space there. Um, but we, we offer some small group sessions as well, um, mm -hmm. which are sort of made up of players from from two to four players um, mm -hmm. we we're based in we have eight centers in greater manchester and then we awesome. also have two centers out in granada in spain oh, uh, uh, we've got we, we we're a team of 32 coaches and we, we we train just over 250 players on a weekly basis so we tend to see that our clients will will repeat each week um that's a bit about us that sort of what, what we're up to at the minute. There's there's plenty of plans in the pipeline. Um, but we're just waiting on the right time to sort of issue those. Mm. Perfect. Love that. So where, where did the name come from, Calculated Performance? Yeah, so it was, we rebranded. It would have been, when would it have been? Just before, probably like the September last year. Mm -hmm. and for, for six months leading up to that, we knew we was, we had to, we had to rebrand uh, because... Yeah. Myself and Adam, that's where the name AJ One to One Coaching came from. Mm. Uh, it's not very, it's not very. Uh, it didn't it didn't take a creative genius to think of it. <laughs> and we sort of felt like we'd just evolved the name. We, like I said, we, at that point of, of rebranding, we we had a team of around twenty coaches. Um, mm. We started to deliver more than just one to one sessions. We we deliver our performance camps as well. So mm. you know, we're offering a lot more than, than what sort of the name suggested. And the biggest thing for, for myself and Adam is we're not in this just for, for, for myself and Adam. We're, we're in this to build a good brand, a good, good culture and a good team. Um, and and what, we, what we, one thing that really killed us is as we grew and expanded, people would want to come in for specifically myself and Adam. And in a mm. way, it, it was great, but also it was causing real problem when it came to expanding because there's only so many hours on the, on the pitch that we can be. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we wanted to rebrand. We knew we needed that. And we, we spent six months in, in trying to think of a new name and, and a new logo and a new identity. But we're really, we're really struggling. Nothing, nothing was sitting right. And we have a client um, and he was based in Spain and he was playing and he was playing for Malaga City and he would always come over through the summer for pre-season. Yeah. And we worked with him sort of two pre-seasons on the bounce and really got a good relationship going with him. And we just said to him, we said, look, if, if things go, if things don't play out the way you want them to in Spain, then no, you've always got a home here and, and we can develop you as a coach. Yeah. Um, he, one day he set up an Instagram page called Calculated Performance. And that was just him just documenting his coaching journey because he started sort of assisting with the club he were playing at, taking the younger ages. And it was yeah. just really interesting. So when we were thinking about the rebrand and the name change, we sort of, I came across his page. Mm. And I was like, that name. And I couldn't, I couldn't then shift the name calculated performance. <laughs> so um, I called him up one day and I just said, listen, tell me about calculated performance. What is it you're doing? And he just explained all it is, is just an Instagram page that I'm just documenting my coaching journey. I was like, interesting. Told him that we're rebranding and I said, we want the name Calculated Performance. We want the logo. We love everything about it. Mm. 
and got a lot of respect for him as well. So I said to him, I proposed this to him. I said, look, we'll we'll give you we'll give you a lump sum of money. That's to just wipe the wipe the slate clean. We'll get the rights to the name, the logo, and we'll also have we'll we'll, we'll set up Calculate Performance España, and <clears throat> we want you to be the director of our Spanish arm. And we'll oh, help yeah. finance it, we'll help support it, we'll help get it off the ground for you. And mm. basically that's that's what's happened, is that's we we did, we got the name calculated performance, we, we we rebranded to calculated performance, we've helped officiate the Spanish side of things for, for, for him and he is now sitting in a in a full time role out there, which is cool. And just wow. developing the Spanish arm in, in a in a very similar fashion to how we did at the very start. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's all like where the name came from. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah, cool. It cool story. <laughs> it is a very cool story. Perfect. So, so you you that have been coaching and training for for a while now. What for you is a perfect session? What does a perfect coaching session look like? So we have this we have this big thing in calculated performance, which is classes the CP way, mm-hmm. and. Our philosophy is very much the, because we train a lot of players on an individual basis, we, we are there to get the player better. We don't have any sort of teams or clubs or, or big, larger groups. So our focus isn't on sort of the tactics of the game. Our, our real focus is on improving that individual. Mm-hmm. And for us, when we think about performance, we think about the technical development, but also the physical development as well of that athlete. So... Mm-hmm. For us, uh, the, the perfect session looks the first sort of ideally a 90 minute session we're looking at. So we would have the first sort of 15, 20 minutes looking at the physical side of the game, which is the things like the speed, agility, quickness, uh, coordination, elements like that. And then followed by some technical work, which might be your passing, your receiving, um, your first touch, ball striking, 1v1 attacking, defending, things like that. Um, and then sort of the last part of the session is sort of our, our match scenario. Um, and that's where we will, if they're a striker, we'll put them into a shooting drill. If they're a defender, we'll look at a defending drill or a winger, we'll look at playing down the sides or things like that. Basically, the last part of the session is is to relate it back to their game. And mm-hmm. the final part of the CP way is then just enjoyment. So mm-hmm. a blend of the technical development, physical development and enjoyment. And we believe that's what the CP way is. And mm-hmm. then that's just how it looks in, in, in a session. So sort of the structure is your physical development, your technical development, and then your match scenario. Mm-hmm. Love that. Love that. So when you guys bring on a new client, what, what are a few things you guys look for? Yeah, so it's very, very, very easy for us. We, have, we had like one mission statement from the very off. And it was just, we just want to work with, as many players as possible and, and, and have our service accessible to as many players as possible. Um, the one thing that we only ask from for our athletes is they just have a willing to get better. They, they show willingness to develop and, and, and that's, that's all. As long as they do that, as long as they turn up to every session wanting to improve and ready to listen, then for us, that's all we look for in an athlete. Okay, love that, love that. So let me take you back to the beginning when you guys first started. What was your biggest obstacle when you first started? And do you guys currently have any obstacles today? Yeah, so I think the very start was would probably be a good pitch agreement. So one thing that we pride ourselves on is delivering the, the most professional service. And to do that, we, we said from the very off, we don't want to just fall into the category of having a bag of balls on a, on a local park. For us, we wanted to, have, to, to, to set the standard a little bit higher, um, but do it at an affordable prices. And that, that is very challenging. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the sort of rental fee of, of facilities is just, just a joke. Um, and when you're trying to keep your services affordable, it's, it's merely impossible to do that. What we relied on from the very start is just developing a good relationship with sort of a facility manager. So at the very beginning, the, the club that I spoke about, that my dad ran, he was at a centre and we just spoke with the facility owner, or sorry, the facility manager at the time. 
And we just said, look, tell us your quietest hours. And basically, we got a list of the quietest hours. And we just said, okay, if can we have it for X price? And we'll fill up your, your quiet hours. And mm-hmm. it, it was really that. And all they would give us was like a, a Sunday 3 till 5 p.m. And it was it was horrible at first because you'd, you'd, you'd be busy all week and then you've got to go do two hours of sessions, 3 till 5 p.m. on a Sunday evening. And that's not for everybody, but that was the only time we could we could get the pitch. So yeah. the biggest obstacle at the very start would have been a pitch agreement as well as sort of maintaining the quality of equipment. So the, the, the privates, the, the required specialist equipment with sort of creating different scenarios with the mannequins. And granted, you could do everything with cones. But when we're thinking about like the, the, the professional, the, the professionalism of the service, but it was, mm-hmm. that was what we were really aiming for. And we didn't want to settle for anything less. Mm-hmm. The biggest problem would have been, been financing it as well. That was a big obstacle. And yeah. still the day is now. Um, it you know on on paper it looks great having eight centres and over two hundred and fifty weekly clients, and it really is fantastic. But to 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 then expand to a new area requires a lot of upfront costs with the equipment and securing the facility with deposits and things like that. And it's not until sort of two or three months down the line that you actually start seeing those rewards come back in. So that would be still. A, a, a tough obstacle we face is mm-hmm. exactly. we're lucky and fortunate now that we've got a few good agreements in place with facilities um, but at the very start yeah they, they weren't there so that would probably mm-hmm. be number one cool so you guys have different uh, training centres yeah so how how do you build those partnerships with these with these facilities then what's the most important thing um I think for me, it was just having the confidence to just actually go and approach them. Mm. So a lot of the times we would just go on sort of Google and Google sort of AstroTurf facilities near me. Yeah. And logs will come up and there, there's, a, there's a couple of websites that actually get everyone in the list for you. And I would, we would just go to the venue and we would just turn up and see if someone were there to speak to. And nine times out of ten, the person you see isn't the person you've got to speak to, but they at least know the person you're supposed to be speaking to and they can, they can pass your details on. So mm. we would just go and we would just explain explain what it is that we're, we do because a lot of the people, sometimes they still just don't understand the, the individual industry. Mm-hmm. We would have to go and we would try and explain and say, look, we're going to have one person working. We don't even need a full third of the pitch. We only yeah. need a half of a third of an L11 aside. But if you go to a facility owner or you try and do that inquiry online, they just they make no sense of it. So yeah. just having the confidence to, sh- to turn up and just just ask the question and, and sort of explain what it is that you actually do. Um, mm. And we would we would also, another thing that we did in the early stages is if we noticed, say, a team was training on the field and say they were only using a half of the field that they had booked out, mm-hmm. go to the organiser of that, that that team and just say if we paid you x amount Mm -hmm. could we just sort of sub sub let that bit of bit of turf off you really for that hour yeah and a lot of these community clubs they they they're happy because they get a little bit of extra money and maybe they shouldn't really be doing it at a private facility but that's Mm -hmm. that was one workaround that we 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 managed to manage to do um but yeah it's just going and speaking to them and explaining to and trying to find the right facilities that actually understand you. Um, mm-hmm. There's been countless amount of wasted hours spent traveling to facilities, and it's just been a no. But then yeah. you just move on to the next one, and, and they are out there. Like I said, we've mm-hmm. sort of done it eight times over now. So, and we've had facilities that we've we've come away from. So, sort of done it more than ten times now, and it it it, it does work. Just going and just speaking to them and just seeing what what is it that they can do. Perfect, yeah. So something that a lot of coaches always ask us in our program is is exactly that. Like, I've gone to the facility, they've said no, what do I do next? So I'm sure when you guys first started, you got a lot of rejection. Oh, yeah. So how, do you, how did you handle that? And what? how do you continue going? I think for us, it's... We just have this... this 
massive desire to to have this this company that actually puts on professional provision and, and really is valuable to, to every athlete that comes in. And that's just that's just an image in our head that no matter what obstacle gets thrown our way, we're gonna achieve it. So if if someone says no, it's almost just a little speed bump in the road. We'll just fine, we'll we'll go to another one and we'll just keep doing that. And that's the same with any rejection, you know, even if it's a rejection of a, of a client, let's say, that doesn't doesn't actually take us up after their inquiry. It's like, fine, right, next one. And it, it's just sort of having that mentality. And I think the reason we have that mentality is because we do have that that hunger and desire to have something greater than than say just 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 for money. Yeah, yeah, love that, love that. So let me keep you back to when when you guys first started. So how did you get your first client then? So it was just a, based off a referral. So I go back to the the goalkeeping sessions that we was doing for a coach. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just based off a referral, and we just we just started from there. And it was just one of those we we get social media. We sorry, we get some clips to put on social media, and it just then snowballed from there. Really, but the mm-hmm. the very first one was was a referral. Right. love that, love that. And do you have a referral system in place in your business? Um. Not at the minute, but come first of May, so very not far away. We we are doing yeah. Okay, and is that that how has that been like the way you guys have got most of your clients, or how do you guys get get clients? So now is it, from the, in the very early stages, it was just based off purely word of mouth. Um, so that that did wonders for us in the very early stages, and and still does to the day. But the only difference is now is we have a little bit more of a bigger budget to go and do things like paid ads on social media, Google ads, um, any like internal marketing sort of, it's, it's, it's full time now for four of us. So there's time to do things like um, email marketing and you know, everything like that. So mm-hmm. we, we get clients now through a range of different methods, but in the very early stages, it was just purely word of mouth. Awesome, awesome. So what would you say, or what would be the number one piece of advice you would say to a, any British coach watching this interview or listening to it, and they're doing it as like a little part-time thing, mm-hmm. side hustle, as they say, um, but they want to do it full-time like yourself. What's the yeah. number one piece of advice you'd give them? For, for me, and, and we, we see it all the time with these sort of coaches that, that – they, they set up as an individual trainer or even their own private academy. And it was, it was rife through lockdown because it was sort of really the only thing that you could do. And it was seen as sort of an easy thing to get a little bit of cash in the back pocket. And the biggest thing that we always say is you have to be on this journey to, to do something greater than just get a bit of money in your back pocket. Because if that's all you're doing it for, then you will quickly get found out. And the unsociable hours... The, the, all the effort that's required to put into it, the the money you'll receive in the early stages just won't. If if it is just a financial decision, then it you, that won't be enough fuel to get get you through it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I would say only really start pursuing it as a, as a full time thing and and building a business if if you genuinely have a bit of a greater mission and and you actually really do want to do something positive. Um, rather than just just get a little bit of extra cash. Um, if, if sort of that is you and you are still, you're sort of on that part-time, full-time side hustling, um, it would be just keep going with it. It's, mm-hmm. There is no easy sort of, until it's able to bring in enough money to substitute your full-time salary, then there's, there is no easy way or easy answer than just, graft in every single hour that you can um, mm-hmm. and, and and you just really have got to keep doing that until you get that balance where you might not even have to match your full-time salary but just enough to live on you know mm-hmm. you get to that point where it's it's enough to live on um you have just got to put in every spare hour like i said it started sunday three till five pm and, and and that's that 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 that's genuinely would be my advice mm-hmm. Love that, love that. So where, where do you see private training going in the UK in the next two to five years then? 
I think for for me, the definite needs to be um, a bit more control in the industry, whether that be through the governing body or a, an organisation like the FA. The, the, the certainly needs to be someone needs to sort of get a grip on the industry because there are a lot of people that are sort of setting up for the wrong reasons and mm. the, the, there is a lot of sort of poor standards that are, are happening in the industry and it's 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 one of those where if the, the, the parent or the client themselves aren't educated and they can't sort of see through through the, the rubbish then people are sort of making a living off off doing something very poor and, and mm. it's not right um, so I definitely believe there needs to be because the way it's going is it's only getting more and more popular and as it gets more and more popular there's more and more rubbish getting getting put into the industry and I, I don't want that to discredit the good that's in the industry as well because there's, there's plenty of that about too um, yeah. there definitely needs to be a bit more control um, again I don't know who, who buy or how that looks but there definitely does need to be be something in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love that. So let's take let's take your your sales process again. Then, so when if I'm a parent and I want to join your program, yeah, what's the process in joining? Do I attend? Is it a trial session? How does it all work? So we come first of May. We're actually sort of restructuring the way we 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 operate. Mm -hmm. uh, at the minute, it's still it, it's. It's, the client will come in um, and we will then sort of repeat their booking. The majority will repeat their booking every single week. Um, they sort of, their system, their details then get put on our booking system and it's just automated through weekly reminders. They turn up to their session, they deliver, get their session delivered and it's sort of rinse and repeat the week after. One thing that we're, we're cautious about is having it on a, on a weekly basis is, isn't, isn't a, a method of expanding and growing on. Uh, we need a bit more, um, a bit more, what would the word be? A bit more guarantee in a way. So mm -hmm. that when it comes to sort of budgeting, we can, we have a bit of, of a better understanding of what we can expect to come in and everything. So mm -hmm. come first of May, we're sort of, we're, we're restructuring to a, a members and non-members um, mm -hmm. model. And that will sort of look a little bit different. If you're, if you're a new client and you would just want a one-off session, then you would come in on our non-members program. Um, however, if you're a committed client and you're looking to do a weekly session, it would be make much more sense to become on a, a, a member and join our, our members program. Yeah. Okay. Love that. And I saw that you guys went to, to Norway to do yeah. coaching session, right? You've also told us that you you're out in spain as well so how do you take a brand internationally then uh, a lot of hard work a, a real lot of hard work and we took we took the last last year so the previous year we have a team of, of four full-time members and we, we sat the the team down at the start of the year and we always have one annual goal one mm. annual target and last year it was just good practice so it was very broad, but basically whatever good practice looks like, then that's what we want to do. And we spent the full year going back through every system we have, every how to book a player in, even down to the littlest things. And if you've seen all these documents, you'd, you'd probably laugh, but even down to the thing of how to write a document. So how we wanted the document looking in what font, in what size, everything like that. We, we spent the whole year documenting everything and getting everything on a pen and paper and I must say it was the most draining and boring year but we we knew at the time that that was the right thing to do ready mm. for this year and, and and every year moving forward so mm. the way we sort of do it is, is now we have a system for everything and mm. it's almost we call it the company bible we we can we're confident that if anybody got their hands on the company Bible, they would they would know exactly what to do, how to scale it, you know, the mm. systems in place on how to open up new centres, mm. templates for everything. And it's mm. a case of really giving whoever that that company Bible, and it's got to be a person you trust, obviously, um, mm. and then supporting them through it. And that's what we found works for us. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's a playbook? In a way, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah okay. that we we we've, we've sort of done and we it, it's sort of backed by everything we've achieved so far here in mm. the UK um mm. so we we know sort of what's in that that playbook does work and it it can't just be a fluke because it's we've sort of done it 10 times over now okay so i'm going to keep you where talk, talking about uh, branding Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a lot of coaches out there or, or trainers that are very good at building a brand online, but they're not very good at building a business. Yeah. So how do you build a brand and build the business at the same time? Yeah, I think um, my, it really helps having myself and Adam. So if you ever met me and me and Adam, I'm very much the brand person, like you say. And he's very much the business person. So we really do work hand in hand with one another. For me, when I think about building a brand, it's very much getting your name out there, mm -hmm. having like the marketing behind you, so how things look, um, every, everything like that. And that's sort of what, what, what I specialize in. Running a business, you think of the logistics, the finances, the budgeting, um, the paying the wages, paying the invoices, everything like that. And that's what Adam's very good at. So if, say, I'll try and relate it to, to the coaches that are sort of one-man bands and they're, they're in there on their own, I always say a couple of things you could do is if you know your skill set is building a brand, then maybe look at bringing a partner in and who you know is good at building a business. Mm -hmm. And granted, you may have to give up 50%, but that 50%, that might make your 50% worth way more than what your 100% could ever be. So that's one way of doing it. If that's not an option, um, become obsessed with building a business. So YouTube, you know, everything's online now. So you can get a lot of information at your fingertips just by YouTube and or Googling and, you know, go on, take up sort of business courses, try and get a mentor that can guide you through what building a business looks like because, that's what me and Adam, we started as football coaches and never never did we ever think it would ever become what it is today. Yeah. And along the ways, we, we, we have had to learn how to build a business. Mm -hmm. uh, and through through things like attending workshops, mentors, everything like that, that, that always helps. Mm -hmm. Love that. So where do you see your business in the next five years from now then? So we... It's something that we try and not actually think about too much because we have this North Star, we have where we want to go. But if we ever put sort of time frames in it, we always think, you know, in five years' time, if we, if we don't achieve, let's say, what we set out from now in five years, but we do it in seven, we don't want that achievement to be overlooked just because we did it in seven and not five. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I understand the question, so I will, I will say it. I will, I will give an answer. Um, but we, one thing that we're really passionate about and would really like is to have our own performance centres. Mm. It would just be um, cool centres that are kitted out with it, part gym, part, part office, part, um, part field. Um, mm. So we would like to have one of those in every major city, but in the next five years, probably say to, to that sort of a, a realistic target. Uh, we do want to have a strong national presence. Um, at the minute, we're just based in Greater Manchester alone and obviously the centres out in Spain. So having mm. a national presence would is, is what we're aiming for. Mm. Uh, I know you touched on, on Norway. There's exciting plans in the pipeline there. I don't want mm. to say too much because nothing's, nothing's actually fully confirmed. So I won't want to mm. say something and it not be true. Um, but having sort of an international academy where the students can come from all over the world. That's that's mm. something that's appealing, and they can we offer different programs through education partners and or mm. just one one week long courses. So things like that. So building strong relationships between different countries as well, all mm. under the calculated performance umbrella is sort of what we see in the next five years. Love that, love that. So last question, and this one's this one's a bit of a personal one, uh, and it's a, two two parts. So number one, what does failure mean to you? Mm -hmm. And number two is how important is taking risks in business? Nice question. I've not thought about that one yet. So <laughs> I won't think about it and give you the best answer. But for me, I think failure is a must. 
mm-hmm. I have a real weird relationship with failure. I actually love it because I think if you don't, and it's a message we try and pass on to all our clients as well. Mm-hmm. I think if, if, if you don't fail, you don't grow. Mm-hmm. So for, for, for me, I, I'm not afri- uh, afraid of failure. I, I, I sort of thrive off it. Um, and I sort of expect to fail because I think if you expect to fail, then if you do fail, it's not like this big weight that comes crushing down on you. It's like, okay, that didn't work. Okay, now what? You know, I can use the lessons for, that, that I can take from failing and, and sort of not do that again. And that's sort of my relationship with, with, with failure. Um, and then what was the second part, sorry? So the, how important is taking risks in yeah. business? I think taking risk in business is a must as well. Mm-hmm. I think you're not going to know everything at the very start. And the only way you, you, you know something is if, if you take the risk and do it. And again, that's quite, quite close to linked with failure. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, if you take the risk and it fails, okay, at least you can say you tried. Mm-hmm. And if it doesn't work out, then you know not to do it again. But then take a risk in something else because that one risk, you might, you might fail and you might take 10 risks. And they all fail, but then that one extra risk that you take might be the one that wins. So yeah. for me, take, take as many risks as you can. As long as they're calculated and they're not sort of stupid, you're not gambling your life saving on it, then, mm. you know, it's, it's, for me, risk is important as well. Perfect. Love, love those answers. Perfect. So, Jack, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming on here. Um, love your journey. Love your story. Uh, I wish you guys all the best in the future. Um, now, if anyone is watching this video or wants to follow your business, what is the best way to do that? So you can Google us, so Calculated Performance. We, we should come up there on our website. There's a tons more information about us on our website. Um, if you want to follow us, our Instagram and all our social medias are Calculated Performance. If you want to keep up to date in in what's happening in Spain, follow calculated performance underscore yes on, on, on Instagram. Um, and then there's, there's contact details and everything on there as well if, if people want to get in touch. Mm-hmm. Love that. Perfect. Well, good luck again. Um, and I hope to see loads of calculated performance centers all around uh, not only the UK, but the world in the next five years. That would be great. <laughs> all right. Take care, all the best, and hope to connect with you again in the future. Yeah, thank you.